Father, we ask you to bless our time together this morning. Lord, we ask you to please speak to our hearts. We ask you to have mercy on our, our country. It brings back a lot of memories for us older ones times in the past when it just really seemed like society was being ripped apart, the country was fracturing and maybe beyond repair, but you had mercy and you brought healing. never complete, never total, because we're still very much living in a fallen world, but Lord, we ask you in this time to give, give us your wisdom and your grace to be part of the healing and not part of the division. We ask you to please pour out your Holy Spirit in our cities. God, I pray especially for Miami Beach right now that, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit in Miami Beach. And that you would raise up an army of men and women in this city who will love you. And who will go and, and love others in your name. Lord, we look at it and it seems silly. It seems like a pipe dream. It's like it can never happen. It's an impossibility, and yet it's happened before in even less likely places. And I pray that you, that you would bring it to pass here, Lord. Protect us from what we think we know, and teach us what's true. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I, I, I need to confess before we even get started today that we're taking a, the tiniest little glance at Acts chapter 2 in light of everything that's going on in our country right now. So we're, we're going to look at it. but. I can't with integrity say that we're studying Acts chapter 2 today, so we'll come back to it next week and look at this same passage again. But the, the title of my sermon today is Focus. Focus was, was something that as a kid I, I really struggled with. I just couldn't seem to do it for very long. There were always way too many exciting things that were competing for my attention. How could anybody zero in on just one for, you know, any length of time? I, I couldn't do it. And today it's even harder. We're bombarded all the time with so much information, so much input, so many different things. You know, all, all week this week my inbox is plural just like you, right? It's not just email anymore. It's text message. I turned off WhatsApp. I just turned it off this way because I, I, I was getting like three, four hundred a day from the different groups that had signed me on. You know, the Calvary Chapel pastors, two different Miami Beach 
police department, chaplains, groups, uh, another chaplains, group, pastors. I just, no, I don't, I don't even want to see the notifications, let alone hear them when they pop up. But the thing that bombarded me all this week, you know, it, it had nothing to do with the fact that today is Pentecost Sunday. That this week, this, today is when the Holy Spirit was poured out. The church was born. But nobody was talking about that talking about everything else, you know, all kinds of observations and opinions and objections and requests. It's, you know, it's so easy to be drawn off course. All the issues that are continually being thrown at us. Let me just really quickly show you a few photos that I, that I found in the, in the headlines of, of the news this past week. Hopefully we're going to do that somewhere. I'm going to be it. Russia deploys military fighter aircraft to Libya. This was the 27th, so that was what, four days ago? Yeah, move a little faster. Russian-Syrian naval forces conduct joint exercise to protect Tartus port in, in Syria, by the way. Next one. Food crisis likely to worsen in the Middle East and North Africa as COVID-19 continues. And again, all of this was from like Wednesday. Front man of prominent Christian rock band says, I no longer believe in God. And then, okay, you guys ditched the headline on that one, so I can't read what that was. But something about the Pope that I can't remember now, but... Okay, what, whatever JP said. That's what that was. No, but basically it, it was a headline about, about the Pope asking all religions to pray. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, it's... Okay, everybody pray. All right. But do you, do you honestly believe, like one of the things that was um, highlighted in the article was that, that he was saying we should all be praying to God as if they are praying to the God we worship. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's, it, they're not. They're not. Muslims don't. They don't, they don't pray to the same God. And there are those who would argue that they do. The problem is when, when, you, when you look at the God that they express, that they espouse, that, that when they describe the one true God whom they worship, he's nothing like the God of our Bible. Nothing at all like the God whom we worship. Now, why am I showing you these things? Well, because I believe they're indicative of, of where we are in our world today. But, but you'll notice, more than likely, that I didn't even include anything about human trafficking or, or police brutality or racism. And please, please listen to me. It's not my intention to minimize the importance of any of those issues because they're extremely important. I can't possibly even begin to imagine the collective grief and pain surrounding the killing of George Floyd by the police officer last week in Minneapolis. I have had several conversations with people I trust in an effort to, to try to grow in my understanding. One day, the Bible teaches us that all evil is going to be eliminated. All evil. Even the evil in your heart. 
And that's the promise implied when God confronted the sins of Israel. In Amos chapter 5, verse 24, God speaking through the prophet Amos said, but let justice run down like water and let righteousness like a mighty stream. One of the other translations, I, I, I like the wording a little bit better, let justice roll down like a river and, and, and righteousness like a mighty stream. But, but listen, listen to me carefully, that is never going to happen in this lifetime. It's not going to happen. The Bible is very clear. I, I, I get so many emails and messages and Facebook messages and Instagram messages and all these different things about how we as Christians need to fight against things that the Bible teaches us are inevitable. You know what I'm saying? You're going to fight against the Antichrist. Now, don't get me wrong, yes, we are to stand in righteousness in the opposite spirit to the spirit of Antichrist, and we'll basically be talking about that today, but you can't, you can't fight against Scripture. You can't fight against a future that God says, this is the way it's going to be. This is what's coming. Like, like what I'm talking about is like the absolute futility of trying to prevent Armageddon. Do you understand Armageddon can't be prevented? It's coming. At some point, it's coming. That final battle, it's coming. Fighting against it, that's futility. Standing in the opposite spirit to the one who will bring it about is biblical. That's spiritual warfare. Meanwhile, see, we, we who love and serve the Lord Jesus, we, we need to recognize that one tactic which our enemy has used very effectively against us, against the church, is to divert our focus so that we end up addressing only symptoms while neglecting to address the disease which causes those symptoms. Now, let, let me illustrate my point, or at least try to. Obviously, I'm a white man. I grew up in Georgia in the 60s and 70s. It was a seriously racist culture that I grew up in. And if you grew up white in middle Georgia in those days, you were immersed in a segregated, a, a racially segregated environment. My neighborhood was a white neighborhood. My church was a white church. My school was a white school. But that began moving slowly toward integration, meaning that my white school, elementary school, was required to start accepting or, or enrolling, whatever you want to call it, non-white students. So, I, I remember the first step in that was, I don't remember, I think I was in the fourth grade when all of a sudden we had one black teacher. Now, they were rotating classes, so we had her for one hour. And then that was it. She was a horrible teacher, so they fired her or moved her or whatever. I don't know what happened. But that was my first experience. Fifth grade, all white. Sixth grade, we had a black teacher again. He was awesome, Mr. Hudson. Football coach at some other school. They brought him in. I don't remember what he taught. I just remember he was, he was a nice guy. Seventh grade. It continued, but it was, it was a highly volatile situation because it wasn't wanted by the white community. But you know, it's not like most white people walked around saying, I'm a racist and proud to be one. It, 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 
It was more like, you know, the, the, the white kids like me, were, we were being raised by the people we most loved, trusted. We were being raised with a prejudiced worldview with no one around to question it. So why would you question it? The people you love and trust teach you this perspective, so that's the perspective. So I was a racist, but that was a symptom. Symptom of what? A symptom of sin. Sin in individuals becomes systemic. You know, we hear a lot about systemic racism, and it's, it's true because sin is systemic. You've got sin in one individual. He teaches it to his children. They teach it to their children. They teach it to their children. It, it's pervasive. When I met Jesus and he showed me mercy, he began to reveal to me what love is. Perfect love, flawless love, complete love, a love that's not tainted by any of the stuff we're talking about. Because my parents loved me a lot. They weren't trying to make me into an evil man. You understand that? But they had been taught that racist worldview as well, and they passed it along. But Jesus began teaching me that he willingly poured out his Jewish blood to pay for the sins of every tribe, every tongue, every people, so that all could be redeemed and, according to Ephesians chapter 2, made into one new man. The Bible tells us that, that he he tore down the dividing wall that separated tribes and people groups. So I was brought to repentance. And, and my repentance wasn't the result of anybody's activism, nor was it merely an attitude adjustment because somebody confronted my racial perspectives. Do you understand that went on almost from, I don't know, the time I was in elementary school, the confrontations. Like I said, this was a very volatile time. We were actively fighting over this issue, the black kids and the white kids, the black adults and the white adults. No, it wasn't because somebody confronted me. It wasn't because somebody taught me. It, it, it was because the Lord Jesus gave me His own Spirit. He gave me His mind and His heart toward all His sheep and made it clear that all are His sheep. All no matter the color of their skin, no matter where they grew up. None of those things matter to him. Racism is an extremely personal and emotional issue for me because I'm guilty of it. I had long talks with Erica over the last few days about this. And not just Erica, a couple of other people that I trust, you know, because one of the things is this issue becomes muddy for me because it is so emotional. It is so personal for me. And when we get really emotional, we don't see clearly. 
when things are, are really, really personal, we need to be careful. And I am by nature cautious because I am by nature hot-headed. Does that make sense? I mean, I know it sounds a little bit like they're mutually exclusive. They're not. I, I learned, I have learned to be very cautious, very measured. Because in the past, I, I, I would just react, let my temper go. And that never worked out well for me. One more thing. God used a black man named Johnny Cobb to begin opening my mind to the possibility that my thinking was wrong. Photo should be up there. There we are. Mr. Cobb. He was my seventh grade teacher. I treated him badly because he was a black man in a white school. And I thought I could do pretty much anything I wanted, say pretty much anything I wanted, and he was powerless to do anything about it because I knew what my daddy had taught me about black men. Mr. Cobb died last year from cancer. And I knew how I felt about him, but I had no idea how loved he was by all of the other formerly racist white students that he had invested in. See, he was, he was one of the kindest human beings. Every summer, he worked in Sears. You know, teachers have a couple of months off and don't get paid all that much, right? Every summer, he worked in Sears. For years, I'd go look for him just to say hi. Because he was I think maybe the first teacher I ever encountered that I believed actually loved his students. Mr. Cobb confronted our racism consistently, but he did it with kindness and goodness. I refuse to make racism a primary focus, and you should too. Because to do that would undermine the objectives of eliminating it. Mr. Cobb was, he was definitely, in terms of influence, he was the most anti racist influence in my young life. And he never brought it up. He never brought it up. Ever. And I can assure you he would not have been all over social media right now drawing attention to himself. He was just too kind. And his impact on my life is, per, is permanent. Racism is evil, but it can't be eliminated by anything other than the cleansing presence of the Holy Spirit in that person's life. I had a lot of questions, but it wasn't until Jesus went to work inside me that I actually changed. That I realized racism is sin. Because my master, my Lord, my Savior 
died for every one of those protesters who were out on the streets setting fire to police cars and doing whatever else they were doing last night in cities all across this country. Jesus, Jesus loves them. He died for them. Who am I to think differently of them than He does? It would be sin. Racism is evil. And evil will one day be eliminated. But right now, today, it's being eliminated in people's lives when the Holy Spirit moves in and begins recreating. So that's my focus. And I will not be diverted from it. I was talking with a couple of guys out front, you know, earlier th this morning. The, the enemy right now is being so successful in dividing the church of Jesus Christ. The, the, the church is being divided by the enemy over issues that are mere symptoms of sin. I have, I have such strong opinions about, about so many things that are going on in our world today, but I keep most of them pretty much to myself because I've, I've been drawn off course before. You see, my, my strongest opinion is that Jesus alone has the wisdom and the right to dictate the focus of my life because He bought me with His own blood. He tells me that loving others as He has loved me and making disciples, training other people to then go and love others as He has loved us, that, that's, that's the correct focus. Because when He truly gets a hold of somebody's heart, now listen, I, I, you know, the, the objections come. Sammy and I were talking about this, you know, immediately the objections come. But, but I know a lot of Christians who are racist. Well, then they're not Christians. You can, uh, listen, I, do you understand I called myself a Christian for decades without knowing Jesus? I grew up in a church that taught racism. The church that I went to as a little boy taught us racist worldview, racist ideologies, because such is the twisted scheme of the enemy. But one who is following Christ, one who has been born from above, born of the Holy Spirit, cannot be racist because the Word of God, which is the authority for Christian life, teaches us that we were born of one set of parents, of one blood, that every single one of us were part of one family. You know, we have different shades, we have different backgrounds, we come from different cultures, we speak different languages, but ultimately we're one people, redeemed by one Savior, and we're being built, according to the Bible, into one new human. We're all being united together at the level of the Spirit, so racism is impossible. Acts chapter 2. I'm going to just read this to you. Like I said, we'll come back to it next week. There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. It's an interesting thing here. They were all Jewish, but they had been scattered abroad. When the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everybody heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, 
We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said they're full of new wine. They're all drunk, in other words. Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. In other words, Peter said, it's nine o'clock in the morning, nobody's drunk here. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. I told you last week, Joel 2, 28. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now see, there's the crux of the matter. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. But the closer we get to the day of Christ coming, the more intense will be the efforts on the part of the enemy to keep people enslaved. He knows all the prophecies. Do you, do you understand? Satan knows all the prophecies. He knows he doesn't have much time left. That, that pretty soon he's going to be chained up and confined to the abyss for a thousand years. Now is not the time for followers of Jesus to allow ourselves to be diverted from our mission. Racism is important, but it's a symptom. We just finished studying the book of Matthew, just, uh, you know, back toward the beginning of February, we were in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, beginning at verse 3, says concerning the Lord Jesus, now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. Now, now please, please pay attention to this. Take heed that no one deceives you. Why is he worried about that? Verse 5, he says, because many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation. You know what's literally being said there in Greek? Ethnic group will rise against ethnic group. The Greek word is ethnos. That's the word that's translated nation right there, ethnos. Ethnic group will rise against ethnic group. People. The, People groups, rising up against people groups. It's, see, it's not just countries against countries. It, it always used to baffle me. Why? It's like he's repeating himself, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Because it just, I, I don't know, it's like, aren't you, in a way, aren't you kind of repeating yourself? No, he's not. He's talking about two different things. Nation will rise against nation. People group will rise up against people group. Kingdom will rise against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. Now think about when you, when you look at everything that he's describing there, if you kind of take a step back and consider what it was Jesus was talking about, wars and rumors of wars and, and pestilences and 
earthquakes and people rising against people and famines, you know, the lack of food, the, usually the result of drought or something like the locusts that are sweeping across to Africa. Do you understand what he's, what he's talking about is absolute, it's just like utter upheaval within the creation, utter chaos, disorder within the creation of God. This creation that God created to be perfectly ordered is less and less ordered. It's more and more chaotic and disordered the closer we get to the end. And Jesus said, it's going to get worse. It's going to keep getting worse. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all peoples, again, ethnos, for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The Christian singer from Hawk Nelson doesn't believe in God anymore. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. See, there's that promise again. I was thinking about this. I'm really intrigued by one of the men, and I'm, I'm getting ready to close. I'm going to ask the band to go ahead and start making their way back up here. But I, I'm, I'm really intrigued by, by one of the men who was there with Peter on Pentecost when, when he preached the message that, God willing, we'll dig into next Sunday. One of the apostles. We really only know a couple of things about the man. He's one of those somewhat unknown apostles. The first thing we know about him is that he and Peter actually shared the same name. You see, Peter was a nickname. Peter wasn't the name he was born with. When Peter was born, his dad named him Simon. Cephas. But the other Simon, who was also chosen and sent out by Jesus as an apostle, he was a Jewish terrorist, some would say, revolutionary, a zealot. Now, when I think of the word zealot, zeal, I always thought about, you know, just like real enthusiasm, but that's not what the term meant for them. It, it meant they, they were advocating and engaged in violent attempts to overthrow Rome or overthrow the Roman oppression of Israel. That was his focus. His focus was on the overthrow of his Roman oppressors, the reestablishing of Israel. The second thing we know about Simon the Zealot, as he's called in Scripture, is, is that apparently his focus shifted when he came to know the Lord Jesus, when he began to follow Jesus, he, he left behind that driving focus to defeat the Romans, militarily at least. Uh, and you know what? I doubt very seriously that, that his desires changed. You know what I mean? I, I doubt very seriously that, that he lost the desire to see justice for Jews in Israel. But Simon himself changed. His hatred of the Romans gave way to a love. Born out of the grace he received when the Spirit of Christ imparted new life to him. 
his focus shifted. I remember a story, I didn't look it up, so I don't have it written in my notes, but I remember a story that Corey Ten Boom wrote. You know, she was the Dutch Christian, her family um, gave safe haven to Jews during the Nazi occupation, so her, her family was killed. She and her sister went into a concentration camp, and her sister ended up dying in the concentration camp, and later, later in life in the United States, she encountered one of the Nazi guards in church because he recognized and remembered her and approached her to ask forgiveness. Can you imagine that? You think maybe it took her a minute? Oh, yeah. She forgave him. She forgave him. And, and I think about that. I was confronted as a, as a young believer, you know, 26 years old, and somebody asked the question, is there anybody on earth that you could not minister the love of the Lord Jesus to right now if they walk through the door. Well, then you're living in unforgiveness. And Jesus said that your Father can't forgive you. He will not forgive you unless you forgive. If there's anyone that you will not forgive, you're not hurting them. You're the one suffering. Simon the Zealot forgave his enemies, apparently. And he shifted to loving them and pursuing their defeat in a different way. Kindness. Overcoming them with good. Listen to what Ravi Zacharias said. You know, he's been getting a lot of airtime in the last few weeks because he was so sick, and then he, he went to be with Jesus, and, and I saw a big long list of quotes from him, and there was one that just stood out to me related to this subject. Listen to this. The Christian faith, simply stated, reminds us that our fundamental problem is not moral. Rather, our fundamental problem is spiritual. It is not just that we are immoral, but that a moral life alone cannot bridge what separates us from God. Herein lies the cardinal difference between the moralizing religions and Jesus' offer to us. Jesus does not offer to make bad people good, but to make dead people alive. It's absolutely true. So the solution to systemic racism abortion, human trafficking, and, and the countless other plagues to human society is not louder rhetoric, a, a, a more forceful, vitriolic Facebook rant. The solution is found in fulfilling the mission that's been entrusted to us so that racists who are dead in their trespasses and sins can be made alive in Christ and transformed inside by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 2, this is the last passage we're going to look at, verses 1 through 4. Critically important spiritual truth. Therefore, you, whoever you are, right? Paul says, you are inexcusable. Whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance? and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. The goodness of God leads you 
to repentance. And not just you, but them also. That's the point. The goodness of God will lead them to repentance. That one spiritual truth is the key to conquering the evil of racism and, and every other evil that exists within the human soul. All our judgment, anger, and social media rants never going to transform not even one human heart. But the kindness and goodness of our Savior demonstrated in and through our lives, it, it just might. You know, I told you before, my racist 12-year-old self said some really horrible things to Mr. Cobb back in 1971, and he responded to me consistently with kindness and with goodness. He was a friend to me when I was an enemy to him. Do you understand that? Ah, but you were just a kid. Yeah. And Mr. Cobb, he knew. This kid, in just a few short years, he's going to grow up. What influence am I going to have in his life? What influence are you going to have? Are you going to side with the enemy? I see an awful lot of Christians siding with the enemy right now, spewing hatred, spewing judgment, spewing vitriol. I got so attacked because I didn't jump on the bandwagon on day one before I even knew the truth. I still don't know every detail about anything that's happened that I'm reading about. Do you understand? So no, I'm, I'm not going to compromise my integrity to make somebody feel better. I'm going to stay silent until I have something to say. I prayed all week. I, what I have to say is that you are behaving like the devil when you're spewing vitriol, whatever the issue. And if you judge a racist for being racist, the Bible says you're guilty. You're guilty. And Jesus said, love your enemies and do good to those. Now, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that we ignore racism. It doesn't mean that we, we justify or condone prejudiced worldviews, racist ideology. No, they're evil. You and I need to make sure that that our focus is right. And we need to refuse to allow Satan to suck us into this giant vortex that he's so good at creating wherein nothing gets accomplished except greater and greater and greater confusion and chaos and division. The Word of God has to be the foundation. And, and you, the, you don't have to, you know, try to interpret. It's really black and white. Love your enemies and do good to those who treat you badly. It's pretty clear. Don't overcome evil. Don't try to, don't, don't repay. Don't repay evil for evil but overcome evil with what? Goodness. Instead of squaring off against each other, going to battle against each other in the name of Christ, we need to be sure that we're actually squared off against the enemy who's trying so desperately to destroy us in the few minutes that he has left on the face of the earth. We need to fight him the way the Bible tells us to fight him, because that's the only way it's going to work. You overcome evil with good. You fight hatred with kindness. That's why Jesus said, you know, when, when they're abusing you, and they're cursing at you, give them a cup of cold water to drink. Be nice to them. Or like I said to a friend of mine, a missionary in another country, bake them some cookies. 
be kind. You don't have to feel like it. You know, a, a lot of times we, that's another lie we buy into. I would, it, it would be hypocritical of me to, oh, shut up. So be a hypocrite. Smile at them, even though inside you're still feeling hatred. Bake them some chocolate chip cookies. Make them some hot chocolate. Smile at them through your gritted teeth, if that's what it takes. And be kind. Be kind. Do you understand? It's your action. It's your action that fights against evil. And you know what else? The Holy Spirit of the living God, He'll change your emotions too. It's just emotion. Emotion is rarely grounded in truth, sometimes, but often it fights against it. But your emotions will get in line with your will when you make right choices and you take correct action. Be nice. Be kind. Overrule your feelings and do the right thing. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. And I'm not saying, I am not suggesting that Christians need to stop speaking up, but we need to speak up in the spirit of Christ, not in the spirit of the world. Amen? Amen. Father, please help us to do that. Show us what it looks like. Help us to do it right. I think about Dr. Tony Evans and the things that he's posted in the last several days. Such a great example of a, of a godly man who knows whereof he speaks. Addressing evil in the spirit of Christ rather than in the spirit of the world. Not jumping on a bandwagon, not pandering to a particular group of people, but representing Christ, teaching the authoritative Word of God, the, the real solutions, the real answers. Raise up more men like Him. men of integrity who love you, to whom you've given wisdom, to speak for you with authority in this time. And again, God, we cry out, please show us your mercy. Give us your wisdom. Make us part of the solution. We ask you to protect our city, Lord, all the talk about a, a resurgence of the virus, and now we're in the middle of this a whole new crisis with you're the only one that can can help us, and and so we. we we come to you in humility and we come to you in faith and we, we look forward to your soon coming. But until that time, Lord, we want to be used by you in our world, not just to make people feel better, but we want to be used by you in that mission that dead people might be made alive, that people who are doomed eternally doomed to be separated from your love, that they might be reconciled to you, made part of your family. Please help us to keep that the focus for the rest of this year, whatever may arise. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to close in worship. And to those of you who are watching the video, or you'll watch it in the future as well, um, if you realize that 
you need to be reconciled to God through Christ Jesus. We want to pray for you. We want to help you in any way that we can. And as I've been saying week after week, we've got materials that we will send you for free that will help you with that. All you need to do is, is let us know. Um, you have to give us your mailing address so that we can send it to you. We'll be happy to do that. We love you guys. We're grateful that some of you are back with us today and look forward to the time when, when we can all be together. Thank you.